morning everyone and uh, glad that you're able to tune in for this morning for our Sunday school. So excited about uh, today uh, being Father's Day and uh, just hope that you'll get a blessing out of the message for uh, this morning for our Sunday school. Thankful for you guys for your prayers for me as I've been preparing for this and just uh, uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do. We have messages planned for uh, this morning Sunday school. Uh, Sunday morning message will be brought to us by uh, Brother Carol Kuhn, and then Sunday night I'll have a message uh, prepared for you, uh, Father Abraham, and I hope you'll tune in for that, and uh, I'm excited about that message. Uh, I'm always excited about every message, but you understand what I'm saying there, uh, but God is good all the time. So uh, anyway, happy Father's Day to all the fathers who are tuning in and listening in uh, to our live stream services here on Facebook, and uh, I'm so grateful uh, for you fathers who are there for your children, and uh, grateful for my father, my father-in-law, um, so grateful for, for them very much, and uh, you don't know how much uh, you guys mean to me. Anyway, let's open up with a word of prayer, and we'll get started into our services. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today, and just for this morning, and, and the work that I know that you're going to do, and those who you bring out to hear your word, and listening in. Uh, on Facebook Live and so forth. But Lord, I pray that you would just do a work specifically in my heart and draw me near unto yourself and uh, help me with wisdom and understanding by your grace. Lord, I thank you for uh, our church family and those fathers who have been here and trying to raise up their children for the glory of God. I pray you do a work within their heart. And Lord, I pray you would help me to uplift the name of Jesus Christ, to glorify your name, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit living within inside of me. And, Lord, I pray that I'll be empty to sin and full of the Spirit, Lord, and that you use me by your grace. I thank you for what you're doing and what you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to sing A Child of the King, A Child of the King. And I remember uh, back in Victory Baptist Church, an old fella uh, dear to my heart, Charles Williams, he would often sing this song, uh, so it was very meaningful to me. But A Child of the King. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full, he has riches untold. I'm a child of the king. A child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now He is pleading our pardon on high, that we may be his when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. And then, but I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though wicks are from home, yet still I may sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. 
With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Amen. I hope you can say the same yourself, that you are a child of the King. You've been saved by the grace of God, and the wonderful work has been wrought within your heart. And, uh, man, we have so much going for us as uh, born-again children of God. And so uh, I want to bring to you a message this morning as we get into our lesson. The Fatherhood of God, and uh, you should see that there is one of the titles on the screen, but the Fatherhood of God and uh, what it means to have a, a Heavenly Father. You know, we have fathers here on this earth, and they mean so much to us. They care for us in so many different ways. They've brought us up. They've raised us to the best of their ability, but what can we say of the Fatherhood of God? And I believe that there's so much more that, that, that we have, knowing that we have a Heavenly Father, and He he cares for us. He's here to hear and to answer prayer and to meet our every need, to catch us when we're falling. And, and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself in the message here for this morning. But go ahead, if you have your Bibles there and available, open it up to Romans chapter 8 as we talk about the fatherhood of God this morning. Romans chapter 8 in our lesson, verses 14 down through 23. I'll go ahead and begin to read uh, for us. It says this, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of adoption again to fear, but you have received the spirit uh, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject by vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. I want you to go down to verses 28 and 29. It says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Then there's one other passage I want us to turn to this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, uh, is where I'll, I'll, I'll pick up reading here. It said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them also uh, which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And isn't that something? The comfort that God brings to His children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for this morning to be able to proclaim Your message, Lord. And I pray You would just help me as I uplift and declare the fatherhood of God, how You are a father to Your children. And Lord, I pray you help me to make things clear and plain, that you would just clarify it by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and by the Word of God. Lord, I pray you open our minds. I pray you would just help us to be sensitive to your Word. And Lord, that we may be better fathers, that we may be better parents, that we may be better children by listening to the message for this morning. Your Word's for all men, for all people, everywhere. And Lord, I know maybe some need to be saved, some need just to, to... help and being better fathers and Lord we just cling to you and to your promises we love you so very much in Jesus name I pray amen amen one of the most eye-opening experiences that anybody can have is to go to a Sunday school class and I remember one occasion Sarah and I we were teaching a teen Sunday school class and then we had a bunch of kids come in a lot of them were bus kids or we well I say bus kids, but they, we brought them in on a van. And you begin to talk to them about how God is a father and how much that he 
cares for his children and how he loves you and me. But the very moment that you mention that God is a father, you know what they do? They begin to oppose their thoughts of their father here on this earth, and they begin to put that upon God. So what they see in their fathers here on this earth, that's how they imagine God above. And, and their fathers, you want to know something, they, they had fathers who had neglected them, fathers who had left them, maybe fathers who abused them. I, I don't know the case. Some of them had even left their children. And so when they think of God the Father, it wasn't a very pleasant sight for them to think upon. And, and you can imagine the situation that I'm in to try to say, well, God's a great and a gracious Father, a loving Father. He's not like your fathers here on this earth. And he's not like any of us who are fathers because he's a great uh, father who doesn't make any mistakes. He's holy and harmless, high and lifted up. But as a Christian, uh, this is what I want you to see, that we can fail to grasp what a wonderful relationship that this is because God is the father of every Christian. We can take it for granted uh, of the great relationship that God wants to have with his children. We can fail to realize that we, we have a God who's never going to leave us, a God who's never going to forsake us. He's always going to provide for us. He's always going to meet our needs. He's going to rescue us out of every trouble. He is a great father. American society that we live in has brought fatherhood into great uh, disrepute. You know what I'm saying? Some may have had or may not have had a father on this earth. Some may have had a great or a not-so-great father on this earth. But let's not impose the image of our fathers upon Almighty God, who is the father of His children. Let's not impose the, the, the image of the earthly fathers onto our heavenly Father. But it needs to be turned the opposite way around. We need to have the fatherhood of God composed into our hearts that we might be the fathers that we're called to be by the grace of God. The fatherhood, according to the Bible, is something that's very honorable. It's highly esteemed when fathers serve their families in a way that resembles how God cares for His children. Let me ask you this morning as we get into the lesson, what is a father? What is a father? Is a father just someone who brings children in the world? They just procreate? What is a father? And let me ask you, uh, what do we mean when we address God as God the Father, or God our Father. What do we mean by that? And uh, what is the fatherhood of God like? And it's important for fathers to know these things in order that we represent the image of God respectfully and carefully to our families at home. At the end of the lesson this morning, and I plan on doing this myself, but I'm hoping that you, as some of you fathers who are listening in, your fathers will take this to heart and you'll begin to apply it. And in order to do so, what I'm hoping that you'll do is you'll sit down after you've seen what kind of father that God is to us. And you'll make a determination in your heart what kind of father that you're going to be. You'll sit down and write down what kind of father that you hope to be for your children, for your family. What kind of father do you want to be? And uh, that you'll take the principles in this lesson and you'll begin to list some goals in order to get there because we can't get there on our own. We need the grace of God to help us. You'll list some goals on how to, to get there, to be that dad that you, you intend to be, and then begin to do them. Be a doer of the word and not procrastinate, not saying, well, you know, I don't know how. Ask God to help you. When we talk about the fatherhood of God, I want you to be aware of uh, an error that's often propagated uh, in various different churches. It's this error of the fatherhood, the universal fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. It's not like that in the Bible. You know, it, the scriptures tell us that there's two, two types of children in the Bible. There's the children of the devil, and there's the children of God. There's the children of light, and there's the children of darkness. And, and even when it comes to the, the idea of brotherhood, hey, listen... There came some people to Jesus one day, and they're sitting in the tent, and, and, and Jesus' mother came knocking at the door. They come into Jesus, and they said, hey, your mother's looking for you. Your brothers, your sisters are looking for you. And Jesus looks around, and he says, hey, who, are my who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? But they that do the will of God, you see, Jesus understood that there was a difference 
uh, between those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil. He understood that there's a difference for, for, the, for those who are the brethren in, in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ from those who are in the world, there's a complete difference. But this was an error that was propagated mainly between, uh, around the turn of the century, around 1900. It was way before then, but around the turn of the century, liberalism began to come into the church. And in and, and, and the scriptures, they would promote this universal take upon the scriptures as they would preach to their, their congregations. And the congregations would begin to believe it. And next thing you know, you hear everybody say, well, God's the father of us all. And I want you to listen to some quotes that have been handed down and influence the mind of the people in our churches rather than the Holy Scriptures. There's a man, he's an interesting character, uh, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Henry A. Wallace. Henry A. Wallace, he says this, he says, We cannot understand either this war, I believe it's World War II, because he was uh, uh, about the time that he came to popularity and rise up in the ranks there. It was around the time of uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But he says, we cannot understand either this war or peace to come unless we have knowledge of the Bible and history of the United States. Expressed in the fewest words possible, now get this, expressed in the fewest words possible, the meaning of the Bible is that all men are brothers because God is their father. All men are brothers because God is their father. The Presbyterian Church USA said this, he says, the heart of the gospel is the faith that all men are the sons of God. The International Council of Religious Education said that the Christian education seeks to develop in the growing persons to the ability and disposition to participate and contribute constructively to the building of a social order. And really, a lot of this is, is, is all about socialism, a social order, a social gospel, so to speak. But a social order throughout the world embodying the idea, ideal of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. A man by the name of Dr. John Horse, he began to write this. He said, the thought that there's a kingdom of evil beside the kingdom of God is all wrong. There's only one kingdom, and every man is the citizen of it. All men are God's children. A, hey, I feel sorry for him because he doesn't understand the scriptures. But the last quote that I want to give you here uh, comes from a surprising place as the Masonic Lodge. And you think, well, where did we get this whole idea of the universal fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men? Well, it came from the Masonic Lodge. They said, when the system of speculative masonry was instituted in London in 1717, Freemasonry became cosmopolitan. Its watchword was fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. On the other hand, the scripture sees things quite different than these men that I've quoted what they've just proclaimed to you. Some say that the fatherhood of God is universal by the virtue of the fact that God had created man. Well, I object to that. I object to it due to the fact that it's not consistent with biblical teaching. The fatherhood of God is not viewed from the perspective of creation, but it's viewed from the perspective of the new birth through, through adoption, as I've just read out of Romans chapter 8. This is a teaching that needs to be cleared up and understood in our time. Hey, we need to get this right. Put this in your mental notes. It's not creation, but by relation that we're the children of God. It's not by creation, but by relation that we're the children of God. Hey, let's not water down the fatherhood of God and how precious that it is. You say, well, do you have proof? Well, God's children become His by virtue of their spiritual relation, not by their carnal relation. By their spiritual relation, not by their carnal relation. Uh, God made Adam in his image and in his likeness, but later on, uh, Genesis chapter 5, I believe it says, that Adam began to have children, and those children were made into Adam's image and into Adam's likeness. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that the first Adam was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is of the, uh, from the Lord of heaven. As is the earthly, such as also they that are earthly, such as the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to Christians. Get this. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption 
inherit incorruption. And so what he's saying here is only the children of God is going to inherit this, this heavenly image when we're changed into the image of God one day. This lost world, apart from Christ, abides under the wrath of God, whereas those who have been redeemed abide where? They abide in the love of God, the everlasting love of God. Since Adam's fall, it's always been about the serpent's seed, that's the devil, and about the Savior's seed, God's children. The serpent's seed, the devil, the Savior's seed, God's children. Lehman Strauss says this in his book, The First Person of the Godhead. He says, If fatherhood means only the ultimate source of man in creation, then the very heart of the New Testament with its unique Christian conception doesn't make any sense. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he says, If God is the universal Father of all men, why does Jesus say within John chapter 3, you must be born again? That, that, that concept, the unique Christian conception where we're made the children of God, it wouldn't make any sense if God is the universal Father of all men. It wouldn't make any sense. You know, the Bible tells us that we're, John chapter 1 verse 12, that we're made the children of God by the new birth. To me, as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so the fatherhood of God means that he has to have children, right? Well, let's talk about that for a moment. The fatherhood of God wasn't just a New Testament concept, as some would have you to believe. I believe that it's detailed just as much in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. You may remember it in the Gospel records. A Pharisee once boasted to Jesus. He said, we're, we're Abraham's seed. We're Abraham's children. And they, they understood that they're children by birth, but Jesus begins to tell them, hey, it's not about this bloodline that we're talking about here. You're of your father, the devil. And so they thought that they were his children by virtue of their lineage, by their nationality being Abraham's physical descendants. And Jesus turns that around. And I want you to understand that there's only one blood in many nations. There's only one blood in many nations. We can all trace our bloodline all the way back to Noah. And if we go back even farther than that, past the flood, we can go all the way back to one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. We're one blood, we're many nations, Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And God had made of one blood all nations for men to dwell on all the face of the earth. But there's always been two seeds, right? Not just one blood, but there's two seeds, a seed of the devil and a seed of God. And I want to get this instilled in your head. Israel used to keep careful track of the genealogies and bloodlines. And you remember there, and whether we're talking about Ezra, Nehemiah, they would go and they would record what family you're from, where did you come from, and they would trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham. And they keep these genealogies and bloodline in careful order, kept a careful record. I want to know something. Jesus keeps a careful record of those who are his too. He has a genealogy record. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life if you never heard of it. You know something, he'll never forget his children. He knows who are his. Generally speaking, the fatherhood of God is applied to the nation of Israel. I say generally speaking. The fatherhood of God, was he was a father to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Generally speaking, let me instill that in your head. I apply the fatherhood of God loosely upon Israel for several reasons, but uh, let me just tell you where he's the father of the nation of Israel, where that's found. It's found in the book of Hosea. Several places in Scripture note where God calls Israel his son, but uh, again, particularly in the book of Hosea, it talks about where God had called a son out of Egypt, called the nation of Israel out of Egypt. But I contend that there's also a personal relationship uh, that's related to us through the Old Testament scriptures as well. And follow me as I go through and, and, and expound this to you. Can I mention how God banished wicked Cain to the land of Nod, into the world, so to speak? He was excluded from God and from his people. An unbelieving world was judged in Noah's day. It wasn't about genealogies. 
an unbelieving world was judged, wiped out with a flood, and Noah and his children, his family were saved. Eight souls were saved. We go on down through, and they would talk about Abraham's seed, that uh, God was concerned about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, whom he would make his promises known, and it was by faith, right? And I believe that I can bear this out uh, if I had enough time, and I can't put it together a whole lesson on this this morning. But if you would just follow me about how God made these promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and, and we get followed that, that God's intentions was to be a father to a, a faithful, believing people. Because when we get over into the New Testament and we look at the tribulation and how God is going to bring a remnant out on the other side, a remnant shall be saved, and God will bring them in to obtain the promises, to inherit the land and have Jesus as their king and their priest who will rule with them for a thousand years. We understand that this is to a specific, a personal people, a people of faith that God was a father to. So generally speaking, it was speaking of a nation. But specifically speaking, God was more than just a father to a nation. He was a father to uh, his people. Two scriptures to further prove my case, and then I'll, I'll stop. I'll leave it there. But Psalm chapter 22, verse 30, A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 16 says this. He says, Doubtless, Thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledgest not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Who is he speaking of? I believe he's speaking of the Gentile people because they were, exiled, they, they, they were alienated from Israel. But they understood that if they had faith in, in God, they understood that they needed a Savior, and God was their Savior. They put their faith and trust in Him to save them, to redeem them. Then they could call Him Father. And the Father-God relationship, then seen through both the Old and the New Testaments, is, if I could just say this, is really based upon the immutability of God. If you believe in the immutability of God, you've got to believe in the fatherhood of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in a personal level, you, you got to believe that. There's no way around it. And again, there's only two seeds found in the Bible, the children of God, the children of the devil. There's the children of darkness and the children of light. I claim 2 Timothy 2.10, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth assured, the Lord, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And John's central thesis statement in this gospel is that we become, we can become, the children of God. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. It says, But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And John begins to expound this idea a little bit further, and he brings it over into his first epistle as he begins to write First John chapter 3, and he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And this word here is, I mean, this, this, this scripture here is something we ought not to get over, the fact that we can be called the children of God. We ought to be overwhelmed by that thought because this is what John is trying to relate to us by using this, this, this term, what manner of love the Father hath toward us. It literally means that that what manner it means something that's otherworldly, something that's alien, something that's supernatural, something that's far beyond us. It's the same thing that the, the, the disciples began to express, I believe it's in, in Mark and, and a couple other of the scriptures, when they begin to look at Jesus Christ and, and they're out on the boat, the storms have come, they, they're shaken, and Jesus Christ comes up and he confronts, he, he speaks to the winds and waves and begins to still them, and they say, What manner of man is this? Did even the winds and the sea obey him? They understood that Jesus was something that they've never seen before in the face of their they never seen before in their life. They understood that there was something special about him. Something very divine about him. What manner of man is this? This is the same sort of love that John proclaims in 1 John chapter 3. What manner of love is this that the world doesn't know? 
that the world doesn't experience, that the world cannot comprehend. And it ought to astound you to have this, this privilege to be called the child, the child of the king. But how sad it is for those who forget. How sad it is for those who are bored with the love of God. How sad it is for those who are just tired of being called the child of God. J.I. Packer once said, he said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. And if this is not, a, uh, not the thought that prompts and controls his worship, his prayers, his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well. There's the children of God and the children of the devil. I think I've said that enough times, haven't I? Now I want to briefly hit a few highlights on how we're adopted into the family of God. And then I want to spend the rest of the message on the characterization of the, the fatherhood of God, how he ministers to us, how he meets our needs. And then I want to make some practical application of how we can be better fathers on account of knowing God as our Heavenly Father. The question might be, well, how exactly are we made the children of God? You know, that's a very good question. People have been wondering the same thing down through the years, and we'll find the answer to it here shortly if you just go over to Galatians chapter 4, verses uh, 4 through 7. It says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are the sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, there are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, we're, we're saved by grace through faith and the finished work of the Son of God there upon the cross. And I want to make that clear right away because I don't want you to miss that fact. But I want you to notice something in verse 5. Two things that begin to happen simultaneously. Two things. What are they? Well, number one is to redeem. God redeemed us. The second thing is he receives us by the adoption of sons. He redeems us and he receives us through the adoption of sons. Two inseparable acts that I want you to get. And what a complete turnaround. It begins to take place in the life of a believer. You know, it transforms a man, everything about him. I mean, when you think about it, how, how somebody can go from being somebody who's dead in trespasses and sin, how somebody can go from having the wrath of God abiding upon him, how somebody can go from uh, being alienated from, from the God of Israel, because they're not, they're not Israel. I mean, how you can go from... All the, having the wrath of God, being alienated from the promises, all was not well with us. And when you look at the fact we were, we were only one step away from hell, right? Rightfully so, if we had broken the law of God, offended, uh, transgressed against His holiness. But then the Son of God, He begins to step on the scene. He paid our pardon full and free with His righteous blood. He, he, he clearly forgave us all. And in the minute that our faith is taken hold upon God's free gift, that gift of salvation, the minute we, we, we grab hold of that free gift, through faith, that great transaction it, it begins to be finished, fulfilled, if I could say it that way. God, the righteous judge of all the earth, He brings down the hammer, and though we, we expect that, that, that sentence that, that is due to us, guilty as charged, He doesn't say that. He says, Paid in full by the Son of God. And Jesus says, put that on my account. I'll pay it. He did pay it over 2,000 years ago. And the judge who's just rendered this sentence, where Jesus has redeemed us, he set us free, he saved us, he paid the account in the full. He also steps down from that bench. You know, you can imagine what you might be feeling, but he has his arms stretched out open wide and receives us. He embraces us as a son. He, he embraces us and welcomes us into the family. The adoption is 
legal. It's signed. It's sealed by the indwelling Holy Spirit. It took place immediately by the authority vested in God alone. Uh, it says, for the, the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he power, to them gave he authority to become the sons of God. If that doesn't do something for you, nothing will. Our passage in Romans chapter 8 speaks of the spirit of adoption. And because we've received the spirit, uh, verse 15, we cry out what? We cry out, Abba. Father, we often say that it means something similar to daddy, an affectionate term, a familiar term, but it means something far more than that. I explained to you by using the words of, of a man who, who's written about this in years gone by. A writer puts it this way. He says, it's easier to explain Abba by using the Italian language, by looking at the word Papa. This is a real word for very young children to use for their fathers, and it's pretty easy for them to say as a term of great love, of endearment. However, the same word Papa is also used for the Pope, someone the Italians particularly hold in great esteem. The word Papa, therefore, holds huge honor, holds uh, magnificence, reverence in that context, and one of great intimacy and familiar, familiarity in the other. What is he saying there? When Jesus taught the disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, when we see God for who he truly is, yes, he, he is our Father. Yes, he does receive us with these terms of endearment, with this great love that blows our mind, how he takes care of us, provides for us, meets our needs, saves us. And I'll get into all this in just a minute. But we also come to him in just awe and wonder. I mean, we, we lift him up. He, he is high and lifted up. He's honorable. We ought to reverence him, showing that, that God-like fear that we ought to have, that healthy respect of fear that children ought to have for their father. I mean, there, there's so much entailed in all this. We ought to offer up our praise unto Almighty God because of who he is. Our adoption in Christ holds with it uh, certain rights and privileges, uh, inheritances, uh, citizenship, and, and a lot more. But we can approach Him boldly as our Father. Many people have had various different kind of fathers down through the years, all of them imperfect. A father that went off to war one day, he left home a very, 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 left home a, very young son. He wasn't very old at all. He went off into the war. He got taken in as a POW. He uh, was away from home for some time, is what I'm trying to say. He comes up, and uh, the, the son, that is, he comes up to his mother. He got curious one day. I don't know what was on his heart and mind, but he got curious one day. He began to ask about his father. He said, Mama, what was Daddy like? She says, Dad, uh, Son, your daddy was a very brave and he was a very honorable man. He was fighting hard for our country. He's fighting hard for you and for me. He's doing all that he can. Son, he's an honorable man. He loves you. Lord willing, God's going to bring him home to us. She went over and she reached across the way she had a, in a bookshelf she had a photo album she begins to reach in and pull out a photo album she sits her son down and begins to open up the photo album and shows her son these pictures about how his father would hold him and how he would feed him and how he would care for him and provide for him he even made some of the toys that he had in his, his toy box and he would see there what his father had done for him over all the years and some time when as he's taking in all these pictures at the end of the photo album there's a there's a letter and the mother begins to carefully pull out this letter and, and you can see that she's very emotional she's she's moved to tears as she begins to uh, unwrap the letter and begin to uh, read it to her son and she begins to express to him exactly the, the words that his father had written to him before he left out to the war she, she he says this he said son 
I love you and I love your mama with an undying love. You're in my heart and you're in my mind every minute of every hour I think about you. He begins to express his feelings. He expresses his desire for the young boy, how he desires to see him grow and to mature, the things that he has for his son. And he, he begins to express all these feelings, this raw emotion. His mama told the boy, he said, you, you have a very special daddy. And he can't wait for you to, to come and to know him personally, for you guys to spend time together. On a personal note, I've found two, two memories of, Two fond memories of my dad. One of them was, my mom has a picture of this to this day, but one of my fond memories that I have of my dad is he's upholstering a, a couch. And the picture, if, if I would take it and show it to you, my mom has the picture. The couch is tilted over, and I remember this. My dad, he's reupholstering everything he, he just he does a lot of work with his hands but he he had me sitting there beside him and uh, as he's upholstering he gives me the tack hammer and he, he lets me hammer in some of the nails and and my mom took a, a snapshot of the, the picture and it just is a fine memory of mine about how my dad would involve me in, in parts of his life and Though I, I might have been a nuisance at the time, I, I don't know. I can't remember that part. But I remember him allowing me to do that. And then there's another memory that I have. Several times he would take me out fishing with him. And we'd go out and we'd cast out the line. And though fishing may not mean a whole lot to a lot of people, it was very special to me and to go out there and for him to show me how to the the to tie a hook and to bait the hook and to throw it out and all of these things it meant a world of difference to me. You know, as special as my dad is, we have a very special Heavenly Father who's in heaven. I want to see if I can declare, if I can put together the picture for you uh, the best I can of what he's like with a limited time, with a limited scriptures I can put together for you to declare his fatherhood deuteronomy chapter 32 i'm not going to turn there for sake of time but deuteronomy chapter 32 you ought to mark it down that way you can go back and look it up later deuteronomy 32 verses 4 through 14 the passage is full of imagery and i could preach a whole message on on just this passage alone but uh, again I'll, I'll spare you that I'll, I'll put that for another time there's two main pictures here that reveal the nature, that reveals the fatherhood of God to you and I. One is a picture of a rock, and the other is a picture of an eagle. And so you see the rock, you see the eagle. One is uh, something that's solid, something that's concrete, something that's grounded to the earth. Another, the, the other picture of the eagle, something that soars high and, and, and soars into the heavenlies, if I could say it that way. A rock. Our Heavenly Father is seen on one hand as some, someone who is, is sure, someone who's dependable, someone who's trustworthy. He's never failing. He's faithful all the time. You can always run to Him. The basic premise here is that we can consistently depend upon Him to be there for us no matter what goes on in the world. You know, oftentimes kids will talk about their daddy. I've, my dad's so strong, he can do this. My dad's so strong, he can do that. And you know, he, but I tell you, I have a God who's strong. I can go to him when the storms come howling, the storms of life come beating in and pounding in on our life. I can depend upon him. I know where he'll be. He's always faithful. He's always sure. He's always reliable. He always meets our needs. He's a sure rock. He's a dependable rock. He's a shelter in a time of storm. Then there's the imagery of the eagle. He teaches us to fly. He's readying us for the world. He makes life uncomfortable so that we'll mature and spread our wings and so we'll grow stronger and we'll fly longer and fly harder and be everything that we're called to be. And it's the eagle, you know, the little eaglets. 
They start out small into the image of the great big eagle, right? And so we're growing, maturing into what the father eagle is. That's the imagery there. They don't, they fall time and time again. They try to fly, but yet they fall to the ground. But the father eagle swoops down and he bears them up on eagle's wings and he lifts them up and brings them back into the nest. He provides for them, cares for them, and, and comforts them. He said, we're never too far from the father's eye wash or from his care. He watches our every move. He knows when we're in trouble. He knows when to swoop down and to rescue us. That's the imagery here. So it's to help us to mature, spread our wings, grow stronger. And the faith of the Christian teaches us to fly. And there's no need to be scared because the Father, he's always there. His eyes are always upon you and me. I want to move on to another imagery of Scripture. And that's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Again, I'm not going to go there for sake of time, but... 2 Samuel 7, this is an important passage because it's repeated in several other parts uh, in, in, in a little variation there, but 1 Chronicles 17, 1 Chronicles uh, 22, 1 Chronicles 28 and 29, it's repeated. And so we see that this is uh, something that's of weighty, something that's important to us. We can speak of God's love here. About how God had declared to David a man who was a man after God's own heart. He says, I want to set up your seed, David. I want to establish your kingdom. I want to be a father unto your son. I want to uh, chasten and show mercy unto your son. I want to be there for him. You know, it might not mean anything to you unless you remember that God owes us nothing. Right? He desires to be actively involved in our lives because a father, that's what he has to be. He has to be constantly involved in the life of his children, uh, watching, caring, teaching, training. When you look at him through the life of Solomon, because, you know, he's the next one that's proceeding after David. He's set up on the kingdom. And David gives them specific instructions. But you see God's provision uh, to Solomon, how he blessed him with wisdom and blessed him with uh, great riches and provision to take care of his every need to establish Israel, to establish the kingdom there. You know, Solomon couldn't do it himself. And the things that God does for you and I, it's not because we could do it ourselves, it's because God and his fatherly watch care has enabled us to have the things that we're able to enjoy. We can't take credit for what God does in our lives. God gave us an instruction book. He taught us how to live in this world. But by the time we get to the end of Solomon's life, what happens? We find that God has to correct Solomon. We find God's hand of correction. We find his hand of mercy by the virtue of the fact that he spares Israel. And we see it played out in history. But today we see evidences of God's blessing and his inheritance of his people by guaranteeing their land even today right and so we see the the fatherhood of god and that how he treats us like children and that's not in any demeaning way in fact it's a very caring careful way he establishes teaches us chastens us protects us he guides our steps but he only intends the best for you and me psalm chapter 68 Verses 5 and 6, the passage says that God is a father to the fatherless, a judge of widows. And Job kind of makes sort of a, a similar sort of claim in Job chapter 29, verse 16. Job says, I was a father to the poor, and uh, the cause which I knew not, I searched it out. The Lord declares in Jeremiah 49, verse 11, he says, uh, Leave thy fatherless children, and I will preserve them alive, and let the widows trust in me. And here you, you, you see the, the father's tender watch cares. He's looking over his children and those who think that they're all alone and nobody's there to watch over them. Nobody's there to help them. Nobody's there to care for them. And Jesus says, God says, I want to take them in as my own, as my very own children. In fact, we see over in the Gospel of John where Jesus tells his disciples, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to leave you orphanless is really the, the translation. I'm not going to leave you alone. 
But I want to give you another comforter. And, and it's the same sort of concept that's found here in Psalm chapter 68, verses 5 through 6. God is a comfort to his children. He wants to be their father. So we see him being that hand of protection, provision of care to them. Psalm 103, verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And here's a demonstration of our Heavenly Father uh, toward us. And we think that no one understands us, but God does, right? I like what Matthew Henry says. He says these words. He says, the scripture says a great deal of God's mercy, the mercy of God. And, and we all have experienced it. The Father pities his children that are weak in knowledge, and he teaches them. He pities them when they are forward and he bears with them or he, he's long suffering with them. He pities them when they are sick and he comforts them. He pities them when they are fallen and he helps them to rise. He pities them when they have offended and he and upon their submission he forgives them. He pities them when they are wronged and he rights them. And thus the Lord pities those that fear him. See why he pities? He considers the frailty of our body, the folly of our souls and how little we can do, how little we can bear, and in all things which his compassion appears. I like that. It's well said. It's a high degree of compassion for those that love him. And though we fail time and time again, God's always so gracious to us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. He's given thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of of the saints and the light. And here we see that God has provided for us in such a great way. He's uh, translated us from the, the kingdom of darkness into the heavenly, into the heavens, and the kingdom of light. He's indwelt us with the Holy Spirit. He's given us an inheritance. He's made us meet to be partakers, which means he's done everything for us and given us all the rights and privileges of sonship. This is the idea here. He's made us meet to be partakers. He trusts us. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. There's nothing more tender than when you see a father who knows exactly how to comfort his children. And when they come to you and they're weeping and they're sad, something, whether they uh, fell and got a boo-boo or something, whatever, they got a bad grade or whether like you just got scared. And he knows how to comfort them. The twofold nature of God the Father here is in providing that consolation that the child stands in need of and providing the mercy that he needs to help build him up and to strengthen him. He's a source of comfort and mercy for all, all of his children. And then James, the last one that I'll give you here, James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And our prayers to the Heavenly Father are blessed by those good gifts that can only come from above. Our Father knows how to give good gifts, doesn't he? But the Heavenly Father gives not only the good gifts, but the best gifts. And Jesus talks about how a Father, you know, if a son comes and asks for some bread, he's not going to give him a stone. He asked for a fish. He's not going to give him a serpent. Our Heavenly Father knows how to give the best gifts. Now listen, I know that there's much more that can be shared from the Word of God. I, I know that. And I, I can go on and on and on and continually uh, draw from every end of the Scripture to show you the fatherhood of God. But let me just end with how he ministers to us and then his application. Just real quickly, as I go down through the list, he, he loves us unconditionally. We've seen that. He instructs us by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. He provides our needs, the food, the gifts, the, His presence there. He forgives us when we've done wrong. He disciplines us uh, when we need it. He uh, is fitting us for heaven. He's transforming us into His image. He's preparing a place for us in heaven. These are all the things that He ministers to us. But now, more specifically, how should we as fathers, how should we be fathers in light of what we've learned about our Heavenly Father? 
And you might mention our care that we need. We ought to be more consistent. We ought to be more caring, loving. Maybe protection, maybe guidance, maybe love. I, I don't know what the case is for you. But I noticed several things that, that us as fathers can apply to our lives. And one is the attention of the father. You know, we need to pay attention to our children, what's going on in their hearts, what's going on in their lives. We got to be sensitive to what, what's taking place there. We need to watch what their needs are. We need to care for them. So our, our attention to our children is not just uh, watching them run about and play on the floor. Though that's fun. But it's even the sensitive things of the heart, paying attention. Father's attention and then Father's intention. Uh, preparing your children for the future. One day they're going to go out on their own and they got to start a life of their own. And you need to provide stability in, their, in the home. You need to teach them, uh, prepare them now for what they're going to face later on in life. You know, a lot of you are already on that other side. But uh, for me, that's what I see. I'm preparing my, my sons now for what they're going to face in the future. And, and I do that by being consistent at home. I do that by providing the stability at home. And these are the things that I, I, I do. We want to leave our children with a good name that they can be proud of. And we want to leave behind something. And we want to leave behind an inheritance uh, that they don't have to worry about things. So we, we leave behind a, a future for them. Jesus says, and well, God says, Jeremiah 29, 11, I have a future and a hope for you. Um, then the father's instruction show them how to face life give them advice good instruction uh, which means you have to let them fall from time to time stir up the nest like the eagle and shelter them like the rock be willing to stoop down to their level and to help them when they fall the father's construction build your family up with the truth and then the father's prevention discipline and love show mercy and learn to show pity as our Father pities his children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want this message to be a help and a blessing to the fathers at home. That they can take these things and apply it to their lives. We've, we're all going to fall short, I know that. There's only one perfect father, and that's you. And as I said initially, Lord, it's, it's not to for our children to impose my image on you, but for you, your fatherhood, your image to be composed to me, for me to be that reflection of what a father is supposed to be, what God, who God is. And Lord, I pray you help all of us to do that by the grace of God. Lord, be with us. Make this a special Father's Day for our fathers. Be with the children. Be with the, the mothers. Lord, be with our families in the church. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I hope this was a help and a blessing to you. And, uh, you know, take it home and apply it. Again, take it home. Write down uh, so the, the type of father that you want to be. Write it down. Write down the goals, how to get there, and then uh, do it. Do it. I look forward to seeing you guys a little bit later on. Uh, again, pray for Brother Kuhn. He'll be preaching for this morning. And then uh, pray for me. I'll be preaching tonight, 6 o'clock. Hope you'll tune in for that. So excited about preaching, uh, Father Abraham. God bless you.